long time ago, St. Francis of Assisi once said that all the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light of a single candle. I've personally always enjoyed using real candles in Lodge. I think that the flame just gives off an entirely different vibe than the old uh, electrical bulbs do. You know, Freemasonry itself was, was once a, a spark that, in my opinion, lit a fire under the, the entire world, the entire civilized world. And it's my goal that one day we can get back to that. Part of that is uh, leaning into our traditions. It was once said that tradition is the preservation of fire and not the worship of ashes. And when you think about that, there's a saying that is often said in masonry. I don't know if I've ever actually heard anyone say it, but it goes, uh, anytime someone proposes a change, we'll say, well, that's not the way we've always done it. While that may not be said, I do think it's often thought. And when we're talking about tradition tonight, we're talking about preserving this flame and not worship the ashes. I think we need to think about the fact that tradition and what we need to, to look at is not simply the forms and routines that we're used to going through, but the lessons learned, the wisdom gained. We need to focus on that which uh, makes us better, not that which no longer serves our purposes. This is The Listener's Lodge, a podcast rooted in Freemasonry. I'm your host, Mitch Dinning. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a pretty broad topic, which is Masonic Fellowship. And I know that some of the things I might say you may disagree with. That's fine. Masons ought to have discussions and we ought to be able to talk about things that we don't necessarily all agree on. Past Grand Master Charles Fuller, uh, back in the 1850s, uh, said that differences of opinion will undoubtedly exist. It cannot be otherwise. It is natural for men, actuated by the same upright motives, and governed by the same desire for the good of the craft to differ in opinion. Were all men to act, think, and feel alike, be moved by the same influences, life would be one unvarying, changeless monotony. So it's my hope tonight that this sparks some thought and some conversation and maybe even some disagreements, but knowing that just because we disagree, that doesn't mean we have to be disagreeable. Tonight I'm going to be talking about preserving tradition and that tradition of Masonic fellowship. We're going to talk about feasts and toasts and songs and festivals and why that tradition is important. You know, as I mentioned earlier, tradition doesn't mean that you can't change or adapt. Uh, tonight we're using some pretty modern technology. We're live streaming. I've got uh, an entire lodge in Memphis that is gathered together in, per in person to watch this live stream. And they're sitting here just like we are in this room, and then they're going to go fellowship in person afterwards. And while we may use this modern technology, I have a feeling that if our brothers from 200 years ago, 300 years ago were to walk into this room, they would still recognize what we were doing and be at home because we're still preserving what matters. And that's our fellowship with one another. That's our education. It's getting together as brothers and working together towards common goals. And the technology and the buildings and the modernity that we add to things do not change that. They only enhance it. And I know they'd feel at home because I found back in the day they were doing the exact same thing with technology. In 1888, uh, Phoenix and Cumberland Lodge got their first stereopticon. And in the papers it says, This exhibit of the Masonic emblems by stereoptic views is very popular in various parts of the country and will doubtless find a permanent foothold in the lodges of Nashville. It should be the duty of every lodge to make its meetings as attractive and pleasing as possible to every member and visitor present, and the steps taken by Phoenix and Cumberland Lodges should be held as one of the efforts to render masonry ornate in every degree. 
I'm sure whoever introduced the first Stereo Opticon got a little bit of pushback from the guys that wanted paper slides or whatever it was they were using before then. But the Masons of that time used the top technology of their day to put on the greatest experience for their members. Moving on to 1963, Phoenix Lodge held a uh, film presentation in color. That was very important. We showed a short film about the DMLA in color, advertised it to the community, brought in non-Masons to watch a movie at our lodge. Again, using modern technology to achieve uh, essentially the same goals. You know, when you think about fellowship, from, from campfires to dining halls, men have always gotten together to break bread and fellowship with one another. Around those campfires, they, they built the bonds of, of brotherhood, and around those tables and in taverns, uh, they carved friendships. And when I think about all these different groups throughout history, specifically male-oriented groups, um, from the Spartans to pretty much any society you can think of, tribal societies, they always met and they had some sort of ritual, some sort of, uh, you know, way that they not only just got together and quote unquote hung out, but they had meaning, they had purpose behind their fellowship. And it's, you know, Probably the most famous dinner of all time that I think of when thinking about these, of course, is the Last Supper when Jesus got together with his disciples one last time to break bread together. Um, it's a very powerful image to think about. I thought a lot about where to go with this, and, and there's a brother, H.L. Haywood, in 1948 that said it way better than I ever could. So when talking about masonry and the fellowship practices of old, he said in 18th century lodges, the feast bulked so large in the lodge that in many of them the members were seated at the table when the lodges were opened and remained at it throughout the communication, even when the degrees were performed. The result was that Masonic fellowship was good fellowship, as in warm and fruitful soil, acquaintanceship, friendship, and affection could flourish. There was no grim and silent sitting on a bench staring across at a wall. Out of this festival spirit flowered the love which Masons had for their lodge. They brought gifts to it, and only by reading of old inventories can any present-day mason measure the extent of that love. What business has any lodge to be nothing but a machine for grinding out the work? It was not called into existence in order to have the minutes read. Even a mystic tie will snap under the strain of cheerlessness, repetition, monotony, and dullness. A lodge needs a fire lighted in it, and the only way to have that warmth is to restore the lodge feast. Because when it is restored, good fellowship and brotherly love will follow. And where good fellowship is, members will fill up an empty room, not only with themselves, but also with their gifts. When thinking about this idea of fellowship and getting together in person, I can't help but think about modern times and just what we're dealing with as a society. And I think that these modern problems require Masonic solutions. Uh, if COVID taught us anything, I don't think human beings are equipped to stay at home all day and not see each other and look at screens. I think half the world gone crazy over the last two years because we weren't able to get out and do things in person. Uh, you see a continued attack on masculinity. I think uh, a lot of young boys are taught that masculinity is toxic. There's an extreme lack of role models within popular entertainment. If you notice, you know, most of the fathers on TV are just dumb, ignorant brutes. <laughs> um, we're also suffering from an extreme lack of loneliness. There's, there's tons of uh, research out there that loneliness reduces your lifespan. And they even took uh, some rats. I know we're not rats, but uh, they gave these rats water. And one vial was just water. The other vial was cocaine. And when the rat was isolated, they flocked towards the cocaine and consumed it basically until they died. But when they did that same experiment and they put them amongst other rats in a larger environment where they could socialize, they did not use the drugs. They only chose the water. I think that, you know, in a lot of ways, we're, we're seeing that played out in a terrible, terrible way in America today. In 2020, we had 93,000 Americans dry, die of drug overdose. 
And suicide is the second most common cause of death for men under 45. The number one is just accidents. But if you think of, you know, other than accidents, um, more men within my age range are dying out of suicide, which often comes from loneliness, this lack of social interaction, lack of true community. With that, I think Freemasonry is needed now and never. You know, there's uh, knowledge is everywhere. If you want to learn something, you can get on the internet pretty easily and figure it out. There's a uh, speaker many of y'all are probably familiar with, Jordan Peterson. He uh, is a philosopher of sorts that got his start on YouTube and built an incredible following, so much so that he was able to sell out the Ryman Auditorium in like 30 minutes. And if you look at a lot of what Jordan Peterson says, it's essentially masonry. He's, he, there's, I, I like the guy, but he's really not saying anything new. There's nothing within his philosophy that's not contained within our ritual. Yet he's got New York Times bestsellers and is selling out arenas, and we're struggling to get membership. When I think of why that is, I also think of, well, well what can we provide that someone like him can't? And while he's got this massive following online, someone like him can never provide the in-person experience, the community, the network that Freemasonry can. What we're doing here tonight and what we do hopefully every week, if not more, as we get together in, in person can never uh, be replaced by a screen. You know, social media, phones, all these things that supposedly tie us together, that supposedly connect us, uh, in my mind, pale in comparison to true real-life human action and connection. Studying history, I think, is the best way to fellowship with our brothers of old. A lot of what I'm going to say tonight, are, none of these are my ideas. We recently started a large history project and just going through, looking at old minutes, reading old newspaper articles. I got a real taste of, of what the brothers of old used to do. And it's fascinating to, to see how similar, similar they are to us. Uh, you can read Grand Lodge proceedings and see that they're essentially arguing about the same things 100 years ago that we argue about today. But there's also a lot to learn there. And I think that one of these traditions that we clearly see is lodges used to meet in taverns. And when I think about your environment, I think about our pillar of beauty. Why is beauty a pillar of Freemasonry? Well, I think it's because aesthetics influence your environment. And you think about the aesthetics of a tavern. <laughs> Some taverns might not necessarily be beautiful, but they are definitely designed to build those bonds of fellowship. It's hard to not have that aspect, that mentality of get, gathering together as friends if you're in a tavern. It's just a natural environment that shifts that psychology towards fellowship. Uh, probably the most famous tavern in 1717 was the Grand Lodge of England was formed in the Goose and Gridiron L House. Uh, a fascinating thing I found was uh, why that Grand Lodge was founded to begin with. One of the main reasons given for forming a mother Grand Lodge in London was to hold their annual feast. The, the lodges had let the tradition of the feast kind of fall to the wayside, and they decided to get together, form a Grand Lodge, in order to bring that fe feasting tradition back and have some sort of organization to it. Another famous lodge tavern will be the Green Dragon Tavern in, in uh, Boston. You may have heard this is where the Sons of Liberty met, and this is where the Boston Tea Party was plotted. There's one rumor that the lodge minutes from that night claimed they were out to tea. Uh, that is somewhat debated, but this tavern was actually owned by St. Andrew's Lodge. So function as a tavern during the day and a lodge hall at night. Another tavern and another Grand Lodge was Love's Tavern in Knoxville, Tennessee. And in 1813, the Grand Lodge of Tennessee was founded in a tavern. It was the meeting place of Tennessee Lodge number two. Um, at that convention, they uh, formed a... A uh, set of bylaws and a constitution. And in all of that, I found the duties of the grand stewards. And it says, The grand stewards shall attend to in preparing the feast. 
On a regular summons for that purpose, they shall always see that the tables are regularly and masonically spread. I don't know y'all about y'all, but I don't know what a masonically spread table is. Uh, something we should maybe think about. We'll get to later in the presentation. But if you've ever heard of a masonically spread table, that was the duty of the Grand Stewards in the Tennessee Grand Lodge back in 1813. Another interesting fact that I found were a lot of lodges' dues were paid monthly. And that's because of these monthly feasts. You were essentially not just paying dues, you were paying for your meal ticket. And if you didn't attend the feast in that month, then you, you didn't have to pay for that portion of it. Uh, lodges also met on the night of the full moon so that they could find their way home easily. If you're staying out at lodge too late after and you're on horseback, uh, you probably, this is a time before street lights or anything like that, you'd have your lodge meeting on the full moon, moon night uh, so you didn't get lost. Uh, not only would you not get lost because of darkness, but quite possibly there was alcohol involved. Uh, Brother Tannehill, who we heard about in our last Echoes from the Hall speaker series in his Masonic Manual, has an entire section on conduct of members in and outside of Lodge. And in one of those sections, he goes into how you shouldn't linger on after Lodge too long after the meeting because you might get lost on your horse and your wife might get mad. Fast forwarding a little bit to 1866, uh, this is one of the largest banquets or toast I've been able to find in the newspapers. The Knights Templar held a grand banquet on December 11th, 1866, a uh, grand festival, I should say, and they toasted. And it says here that the company attacked the edibles with orderly precision, but with a hearty zest. Soon the champagne corks were flying from the foaming necks of dozens of bottles from every quarter of the tables, and then followed the reading of the toast. It goes on to say, then following in rapid running fire wit, sentiment, and antidote to the tuneful accompaniment of popping corks, Sir Knight Charles Fuller got off a couple of taking anecdotes which brought down the house. He then proceeded, uh, he then proposed the health to the Grand Commander of Tennessee. So as you can see, this is uh, more of the article talks about the formality of this banquet, but it's also they're just having a good time. They're giving toasts, they're making fun of each other, they're telling stories, they're fellowshipping as brothers. You know, banquets and feasts are not the only way to fellowship. Uh, this is past master of our lodge, George Blackie, and in 1868, he gave a very impassioned speech to the lodge about the value of lodge libraries and why we needed to build a library. And part of his uh, speech was focused on the general public. He wanted this library to be open to the public as a way for Masons to enlighten the world, to help the working man, to provide these books for people who couldn't afford them. But he also went on to say, just amongst the brothers themselves, that nothing unites people like companionship and intellectual enjoyment. Hopefully y'all are having some intellectual enjoyment tonight. Uh, I think when we get together in these sort of settings and we have real discussions, it's another competitive advantage that masonry has that there's not a lot of places in society that you can find that. You know, I can go to the Chamber of Commerce or all these other networking events, but, but essentially you're just going to hand out business cards and that's going to be it. Whereas in masonry, I can sit down with a brother and talk in depth about any topic you can imagine. And usually it's intellectual. Sometimes I've been in this lodge till 1 a.m., you know, just talking. And I don't know anywhere else for me in society where I can get that. They built the library shortly thereafter, but in the 18, uh, 1883, they decided to add reading rooms. And you can see a great many visiting Masons are in the city today, a majority of them being representatives to the Grand Lodge, which meets tomorrow. While here, they will have opportunities to visit the Masonic reading rooms. These rooms are handsomely furnished, and the walls are adorned with many beautiful and appropriate paintings and engravings. The representatives generally must be greatly pleased at this evidence of the prosperity of the order in Nashville, not to say anything of the comforts they may experience at headquarters. So they didn't just create some room for guys to come hang out. They, they 
adorn them, that going back to that beauty point I made earlier, they created a space to foster this intellectual enjoyment and this fellowship with one another. So you can fellowship at a feast, you can fellowship at a library, you can fellowship within the lodge, but Brother John B. Garrett, past uh, Grand Secretary of Tennessee, past uh, Master of Phoenix Lodge, tells the story that, as has been my custom for many years, many exceedingly pleasant and happy hours have been spent with my brethren in their lodges and homes. On one occasion, I rode 10 miles in a two-horse wagon, mostly through the woods on a new, <clears throat> new unmarked road. But at the end of the journey, I met one of those warm-hearted warm masons whose genuine hospitality cannot be exceeded. One who never finds time to mix and mingle with his brethren in their homes and around their firesides rarely sees the inner beauties of masonry. Brother John B. Garrett, uh, he was affectionately known as Brother John, and he was well known throughout the state as being the best ritualist in the state. Uh, I found many an article about how he would just stay in his office at the Grand Lodge, which was at the Masonic Library, and any time you walked in, there'd be 12 or more Masons just hanging out, having a good time, learning ritual, discussing anything. It was, it was a, a community spot. It wasn't a a place that was just open during business hours or was only open for degrees. They were there full time enjoying each other's company. But another thing Brother Garrett did was fellowship outside of the lodge. So him and uh, uh, many of other members from Cumberland and Phoenix uh, decided to start the Swan Creek Fishing, Boating, and Hunting Club. That sounds pretty self-explanatory, but when you start reading the articles that they put in the paper about themselves, you quickly find that it may not have involved much fishing. Uh, one article says that uh, Duncan McKay left the city on their, uh, excuse me, Duncan McKay joined the Swan Creek Fishing, Boating, and Hunting Club. He was taken in more by way of ornament than for his abilities as a piscatorial artist. Everyone knew he was no fisherman. And it goes on to say that uh, it was best to suspend the rules and take him in, as they thought he could be made useful to big bait, carry snake medicine, in quotations marks, and cook for the club. So I asked myself, well, what, what is snake medicine? And I uh, found another article where it says, the Swan Creek Fishing Club left the city on their 47th annual fishing excursion. Mind you, most of these guys were not in the, even in their 40s, so... 47th seems like a make, made up number. But they left on their 47th annual fishing excursion, packed in boxes were tents, cooking utensils, grub, fishing tackle, and other paraphernalia of the club, while a suspicious looking keg labeled vinegar, but supposed to be snake medicine, was closely guarded by one of the members. On this particular journey, John B. Garrett supposedly caught this image that you see in the top right corner. So uh, he was president of the club, and this uh, animal here is supposed to be the ancient wangdoodle that was said to live in the mountains of Hepsidim and mourn for its firstborn. Uh, this entire article of John B. talking about how he almost caught this thing, and somehow he got off the hook and he was not able to return with this ancient beast. And in telling this story, they're sitting in the Grand Lodge library, and a question is posed, have you been drinking any of your snake medicine, inquired Joe Carrolls, who had paused in his game of dominoes long enough to listen to the recital. Never drank a drop in my life, answered Garrett. And Barney Phillips groaned. I didn't know that you used to uh, create drinking clubs and then write about your exploits in the newspaper, but that must have been what they did before Facebook. Uh, but as you can see, that all of this, this, this tale is going on in the Grand Lodge Library. And again, they're not there just to work. They're not there just to do ritual. They are simply hanging out, having a good time. Joe Carroll, who is mentioned here, is playing dominoes and listening to this story. This is also around a time, though, that in 1896, the Grand Lodge... Uh, 
started banning initiations of anyone who was involved in the manufacture or sale of liquor. So in 1896, we said, if you're involved in the liquor business, you can no longer become a Mason. But 15 years later, they're writing about their drinking stories in the newspaper. So here's another big event I found, Cumberland Lodge's 100-year anniversary. So this is the old Maxwell House Hotel since burned down. But I couldn't find much uh, description about this event. But as you can tell, you're looking at 100 plus Masons, I would guess, all gathered together in formal, fine dining, dressed nice, ready to fellowship and celebrate their 100th year anniversary. Another event I found uh, were the what they called the Old Man Carroll's Dinner. So Jer Joe Carroll, who was mentioned earlier, was the oldest Mason in the state. And for about a five-year period, they got together every single year and they had a dinner to Joe's honor. And they would all stand up and give toasts to Joe and tell stories about Joe, and then he would give a speech afterwards. Again, this wasn't anything organized by the Lodge. This was simply Masons in the city getting together and having a good time. Uh, somewhat in honor, but somewhat at the expense of Old Man Carroll's. This is an event that C Phoenix Lodge hosted. It was a uh, master's degree, and they were initiating a prominent member of Nashville, and they invited the governor, who was a Mason at that time, as well as many members of the state legislature. And you can see at uh, 7.30 p.m., they had a reception. 8 o'clock, they conferred the degree. 10, they had another uh, reception. And then they follow by cigars, uh, follow up with cigars. For this time period in Phoenix Lodge's history, I couldn't find a single event hardly where they did not have cigars. And they put this in the newspaper. Not only did they have those cigars, but Brother Brandon Sawyer, going through the minutes, happened to stumble upon uh, a budget and the lodge was paying for said cigars, not the members. In 1915, uh, Cumberland Lodge built a new temple on 7th Avenue that Phoenix Lodge also occupied. So they got together, Cumberland and Phoenix, and had a lodge dedication ceremony. And I found this old menu from the event. They had a banquet at 8.30. I don't know how many of y'all can read that, but it's oysters on the half shell. I don't know how hard it was to get oysters in Nashville in 1915, but I imagine it was quite a feat. And as you can see, uh, all the fixings, so to speak, coffee, music, uh, and then toast. And Joseph Toy Howell, who is a member of Phoenix, was presiding. And then it says the toast will be responded to by the following. And they have the symbolic lodge, the royal arch, the select master the Templar, the progress of masonry, and the home of the craft, and the, the gentleman who gave those speeches. You may be asking yourself, well, what, uh, what is a response? Well, I can't find much within Tennessee masonry where it's written out how a uh, festive board is supposed to be held, but it's a very common thing throughout a lot of other jurisdictions, especially in England. And it was common here for, for at least 100 years. At some point, it started to die out. But if you read how to have a proper festive board, uh, there is some ritual to it. There is some ceremony to it. And part of that is the responses that we just heard about. So I can't prove that at this event in 1915, they were doing the entire festive board. But they were at least giving toast, and they were at least giving responses. Uh, part of the toast, typically there's seven traditional toasts. And then when a member gives that toast, there is then the response. The response can be a short speech, which it appears uh, to be what those gentlemen were doing based off the topics that were listed. Uh, there could be a poem. There could be a song. Um, there's also uh, music. Music during, before, after, really up to the lodge there. But there's... Uh, untold amounts of Masonic hymnals uh, from back in the day where we used to have music not only in our degrees, 
but clearly within these festive board situations. And certain lodges even had their own music. So if you were a member of a lodge, your lodge had its own specific song that you may sing during or a part of this toasting, this festive board ceremony. Uh, taking wine was usually happened before the toast. This is where the master either privately or uh, with the rest of the uh, dinner guest would drink a glass of wine with his officers standing up in a toasting fashion and everyone else would applaud. Usually it was his officers, but it could really be whomever he appointed to take wine with him to kind of kick off the event, which was followed by the toast responses and firing glasses. If you're not familiar with a firing glass, there's an image of one made by Brother Patrick Craddock. Uh, as you can see, the bottom of it is very thick, and that serves a purpose. After you would take your toast, you would slam it on the ground and fire. Uh, that was known as giving the good fire. Well, why would you do that? Why, why would you take a shot and slam it on the ground? Is there any uh, esoteric meaning behind any of that. The uh, only thing I can think of is it's just fun. <laughs> you know, it's kind of tribal. You're getting together, you're having a good time, you're banging the table, you're fellowshipping. So I ask this question, and uh, we will be taking questions after. You can ponder on all this. But are we preserving this tradition of the festive board today, and beyond just that specific tradition of the fest festive board, are we putting an emphasis on our fellowship? Are we truly placing the importance on it that we should? You know, we uh, we do things today. We we call from labor to refreshment. Well, why why would we do that if that didn't have some purpose a long time ago? Uh, one thing I clearly saw here was they always had their meetings first and then the mill to follow. A lot of lodges do that the opposite today. I think the reason you had the mill first, I mean, excuse me, the meeting first and then the mill is so that the fellowship after the meeting could carry on throughout the night. The way we currently do it, you have your mill and then you get rushed into a meeting and you could be in the middle of a great intellectual conversation and then you get drugged away to go into a meeting. Uh, it only makes sense that if you are having your meeting first and the meeting might be going longer, that that would be the reason you would call from labor to refreshment to then go break. Uh, you know, the junior warden is charged with looking over the craft during that refreshment. Uh, what's he doing? If, if there's no formality to this, if there's no ceremony to this, what, what is the junior warden's job? Is he, is he there to make sure someone doesn't eat too many mashed potatoes? So, so, so we, we have remnants of this stuff in our ritual, but for at least the last hundred years, it seems to have gone away. But I can show you up until at least 1915 in Tennessee, we were actively taking part in these festive boards with alcohol in our lodge rooms, or in our lodge buildings, I should say. The natural question here is why did this change? Um, there's a lot of different theories. Uh, definitely the temperance movement was large in the South. You had prohibition. But what I think really happened, or at least the start of this, was the Morgan Affair. If you're familiar with the Morgan Affair, I won't spare all those details, but it was a very bad time for the fraternity. Uh, Freemasonry essentially almost died in a lot of places. A lot of lodges went under. And when it rose back again, it, it came back with this view towards popularizing itself with the public. So we ingratiated ourselves with the clergy, and we started putting more emphasis on charity. And basically the, the whole of society were, were saying that we were evil, we were bad, we were this. So we came out and said, no, we aren't. We don't drink. We do charity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was, it was a PR move in a lot of ways. And in my mind, we, we basically let the enemies of Freemasonry define who we are. And I think that while maybe that was the right thing to do at that time, I think that it's prudent for us to go back 
and find out who we really are. Find those traditions, preserve that fire, and let's get back to tending this flame of fellowship that unites us as a common band of brothers. With that, I'll take questions.